For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. All right. Looks like we are live and ready to have some fun. Uh, I hope everybody appreciates the thumbnail as much as we do. Um, certainly uh, represents the critics perfectly in the fact that the evidence that we are going to present tonight, the critics, the evolutionists, the scoffers, they do nothing but dodge and avoid that evidence as, as best as they can. Essentially just deny the reality of genetic entropy, genomic degeneration. So this is going to be a lot of fun. We've got uh, Brother Rama, Brother Will here. Uh, the reason why we're doing this show titled The Destroyer of Fish to Fisherman Evolution. Genetic entropy, the evolutionist's worst nightmare. It really is the evolutionist's worst nightmare. They've got no good rebuttal, no good argument against this reality. Okay, the fact that mutations are accumulating from generation to generation, okay, far too quickly for selection, which is limited, far too quickly for selection to filter out all of these deleterious mutations. And we are going to be covering it in great detail, as well as refuting all the best arguments that the critics have to offer. Uh, so Will, he has been uh, doing a study, a personal study on genetic entropy, from my understanding, and Will, correct me if I'm wrong, you uh, just recently, you've at least been reading through genetic entropy, so therefore you got some questions, some input, you've learned a lot, so you've got a lot to, uh, a lot to say on this topic. So Will, good to have you. Matt, good to have you. Will, what are your thoughts in general of uh, genetic entropy and, and your current study on it? Well, mutation are accumulating. We're going down. That's what the evidence show. We're looking at the evidence. The evidence show that, you know, it's a recent creation that has been devolving, as God says, you know, for thy sake, I will curse thee. He cursed the ground. Everything went down. It's lying, lying down. We can see that from the, you know, uh, if we read into Genesis 8, I think we can see that the age is decreasing everything's decreasing the radiation you know the uh, magnetic field so we're decreasing down more mutation accumulating we're just lying down there's a lot of papers on it a lot of evidence from creationism from evolutionists you know from agnostic so i think the evidence are really showing up that we're lying down we're degenerating not evolving and i think it's a big problem for a common ancestor if we have been there for two thousand uh, years it's it's not possible with the numbers of mutation we will have in our genome. So yeah, that's that's my thought on it. Right, good point, good point. So basically, guys, um, in the chat, and then uh, Matt, elaborate or, or give your thoughts if you wanna add anything to this. But basically, we know now that the mutation rate is extremely high, okay? It's roughly 100 new mutations per person per generation and roughly three new mutations every cell division in our body. So it turns out that there's genetic entropy on a personal level, right? Generally, that's why we die is due to mutation accumulation. But there's also genetic entropy on a population level. 
because many of these mutations, okay, are passed on to the next generation. And here's another thing that I want to point out too, is that harmful mutations, okay, vastly outweigh truly beneficial mutations, okay? So the fact is more harmful deleterious mutations, they are accumulating in the genomes of living organisms, okay? from generation to generation with beneficial mutations, truly beneficial mutations being incredibly rare. And that's the problem. Most of these mutations are deleterious. Natural selection is only limited to removing the worst, most detrimental of mutations, okay? Because nobody disagrees with natural selection. And natural selection can amplify the best of the beneficial mutations, but it can do nothing against these nearly neutral, these effectively neutral mutations that are pouring into the genomes of living organisms generation after generation, okay? So that's pretty well the uh, basics of genetic entropy. You know, we are all more mutant every single day, okay? And there's really nothing that natural selection can do to stop the inevitable genetic degeneration of our species of humans and other living organisms as well. It may be able to slow it down, right? But it can't actually stop this process. Um, so Matt, thanks for being here, brother. Uh, anything you wanted to kind of add to that, elaborate? in terms of just the basics of genetic entropy and, and what it is? Uh, sure. Let me know when you're going to make sound. I can mute up in a minute. But um, yeah, real quick, uh, I'll share a screen real quick. And let's look at, this is what you just mentioned. Um, I'm going to enlarge it because, wait, can everybody see? Oh, there it is. It's just lag. This is what you mentioned. I just square, yeah. So it's the accumulation of 100 to 200 new mutations. The number can range. Sometimes it's down to, you know, about 47. Sometimes it's around 230. But in general, this is the accumulation. Now, this is one aspect of genetic entropy. So some studies will tell you this. We define mutation rates as the rate of which the mtDNA type of an individual changes rather than the rate of mutation accumulation of an individual. So that's when you're talking about genetic differences, mtDNA differences between people. So sometimes what I'm, what I'm getting at is you will find a mutation rate study. will sometimes look at accumulation, but for the most part, they're going to look at differences, right? They're going to be trying to say, okay, how many mutations are there that have accumulated that are detrimental? How many can we count and how different are we from one another based on that criteria? So we are seeing the accumulation of 100, but those are near neutral. So they're also affecting us. That's what um, John Sanford has discovered as well, because they're not neutral. They're slightly deleterious, but selection cannot see them. And for those that say, well, you know, selection can, uh, can see them. Well, uh, some bad news on that front is they have, sorry, gotta, you got to do everything for me tonight. You got to share my screen again. <laughs> uh, this was their comment. Selection is unlikely to be a major factor that underlies the differences between the phylogenetic, which is the evolutionary, and the pedigree divergence rates, which is not the same thing as saying that selection does not act on mtDNA. So they're saying that selection can remove them, but overall, it doesn't have that much of an effect. It can't it can't do as much as they're saying it can do. And that's, and they still can't figure out the disparity between why the phylogeny says it's here and the pedigree, the observed mutation rate is saying it's so quick. So there's that disconnect. They're saying it's selection, but selection can't do it. So they're admitting it. And um, that's, uh, this is what, uh, sorry, I'm going to share screen. <laughs> I'm going to keep you busy tonight. This is what a lot <laughs> that's of what I'm here for. This is what people think of with genetic entropy right here. <laughs> oh, that right there is, that's genetic entropy in action, guys. <laughs> that's more inbreeding, actually, but still, it's another example. That's now not up. <laughs> How is that guy going to evolve into anything in the future? He's not. He's going down. That you have to give him time. Right. 
And, and that's the major problem. For one, inbreeding, as we always say, is a sneak preview into where we are going genetically as a species, right? It's like a small scale uh, example of genetic entropy, okay? As the human population accumulates more and more mutations from generation to generation. Um, but when it comes to the resolutions or so-called solutions that the evolutionists are putting forth, they all fail essentially, but a lot of them are misrepresentations as in they make it out to sound like creationists or proponents of genetic entropy ignore the role of natural selection, right? No, we agree natural selection happens. The problem is, is it is limited Okay, as you were pointing out, these effectively neutral mutations that are only slightly deleterious, right? They are pouring into the, our genetics from generation to generation. And because they're effectively neutral, they're only subject to what? They're subject to genetic drift, okay? They're essentially invisible to natural selection. And that's why the bigger picture of this all is the fact that the evolutionist explains the origin of all genetic diversity as the result of mutations over time. Okay, these typographical errors in a text, right? So that's why they're gonna have that problem is they wanna drive their fish to fishermen through a process of genetic mistakes, deleterious mutations that are eroding genetic information essentially from generation to generation. While we as creationists, we recognize the fact that mutations are the destroyer and not the creator. So we explain the vast majority of DNA differences as the result of what? De novo creation, created heterozygosity as uh, James Downer loved so much. So that's the major problem with their models. They want to explain all these DNA differences as the result of mutations. No, now we know mutations are incredibly damaging, incredibly deleterious, and most of them being unselectable, invisible to selection, okay, because they're effectively neutral. They're only subject to genetic drift. Um, my question to you, Matt, is you'll hear the evolutionists, they'll acknowledge the fact that mutations are accumulating, right? They want to assume most of them are absolutely neutral, but they'll say that there's no actual observable evidence, empirical evidence that genetic entropy is occurring in populations today. What are your thoughts on that? There's no evidence for genetic entropy. It's all made up. It's not real. Young Earth creationists invented it. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Well, if if we made it up, how come all of these people right here acknowledge it? How come Kimura, called Kimura's Quandary, right here? You know, we have uh, Mueller, uh, Mueller's Ratchet. And we, we have all of these examples of people that have come across this problem and said, interesting, what are we going to do about it? And how can we solve the problem? Because it's a problem with evolution. And then we get people on the internet that come and say, none of these people are real, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't know what they say. Um, they, they probably get mad that one of these is a creationist. So therefore, none of these people can be correct. That's probably their best argument. Because it's a reality. And it's just what we see. That's what we know. I mean, wh what do we know? Beneficial mutations are extremely rare. They admit that. They're, they're hard to prove and they're very, very rare. So then we get empty DNA. What do we see when we look inside the mitochondria? We find, wow, it's surprisingly common to have mutation mutations arise. Well, that shouldn't be, right? If, evo if these mutation rates are supposed to be slow, and we're not supposed to be seeing them, then how come they're fast? How come we see them? How come when we look and, oh, look, there's genetic meltdown of gorillas. Why? Because of just like the Neanderthal, isolated and uh, exactly what we expect. How about, um, actually, we go right here. How about the mammoth? What happened to Neanderthal? The same thing that happened to the mammoth. They migrated north. They got stuck in the snow. They had genetic meltdown. Fast mutation rates, it killed them, just like it killed Neanderthal. It's not a myth. It's not some mystery. We have the evidence. How about some animals alive today? Where do we get mutation rates from, right? Remember, I said earlier right here that mutation rates, it's not about accumulation. It's the rate of change. So how come when we look at modern-day chickens, what do we find? 
we find exactly what we would expect looking at humans. The mutation rate right here shows that the rate of evolution in the pedigree is 15 times faster than it's supposed to be. Based on what? Evolution. They base their predictions on the assumption of evolution being true. So they go by the phylogeny rate, which is a split. This is the human split. And it's based on calibration. It's all based off the fossil record. So because the fossil record isn't true, therefore their mutation rates aren't true. It's really that simple. And they even admit it, Un you know, unfortunately for them. Look, they even say it in their own words when they look around. They go, there is no trace in the geologic record of any global event 200,000 years ago. <laughs> but we have the genetic evidence that tells us there was a genetic reset in all life at exactly the same time. So literally, we have ge genetic evidence. They went to the physical evidence and they said, wow, our made up record isn't true, but the genetic evidence is. So we're just going to go with the genetic evidence and say, we don't know what in the world caused it, but it happened anyway. As far as the evidence, I guess we'll figure it out one day. So they don't really care because they know they had to retrofit the data no matter what, because the genetic evidence doesn't lie. And it's not just human beings. And it's not just like chipmunks and squirrels were genetically reset. It's everything in life, even even the aquatic life. So a volcano couldn't do it. So they can't blame it on the Toba catastrophe, like one massive volcano destroying all life. They can't blame that because that sure wouldn't hurt a sea urchin on the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. So they were like, okay, we have a problem. So in the meantime, they're just going to deal with it and say, we'll figure it out eventually. But they stick to the 200,000 year date because that's that was one of their early on predictions. So they have some problems with that. So I like to point out that it's an all species problem, right? Most species are not driven to extinction before genetic Im factors impact them. Well, that's pretty odd, right? So if they're going extinct, what would you expect to have happen? Well, exactly what we say is happening. They're going to from the heterozygous state into more of a homozygous state. Mutations are accumulating. They might be being inbred. It might be even faster. And then they die. Pretty simple. And then here, right from their own mouth multiple different places what happens now these aren't just mutations these aren't the de novo these aren't the de novo near neutral mutations that always get handed down these are harmful mutations look at that exactly what we would expect around five thousand years ago an explosion about 200 to 400 generations harmful mutations just came out of nowhere they just exploded on the scene and here they are detrimental mutations everywhere that's what that's not what evolution should be saying with mutations these mutations are what need to be there to cause diversity. And they're admitting that these mutations arose thousands of years ago, a few hundred generations ago. So which is it? Did with the 200,000 year old bottleneck cause all the diversity and, and the, you know, what we're seeing? Or are you admitting that these what's really causing diversity only arose just a few thousand years ago? You can't have your cake and eat it, too. Right. And that's just, yeah. I did. There was a paper about like the E. coli when they were speaking about like uh, they were breaking down a bunch of disease. Like, you know, they did like a bunch of generation of bacteria or something like that. And they were speaking about how they break out apart, like trying to survive. Like this is not what evolution is supposed to teach. Like, you know, it's supposed to gain stuff in order to get where it is. And how is it that, you know, in order to survive, they lose a bunch of information and genome like it's split apart. I mean, how does evolutionists explain all those papers? There's literally papers on, uh, I think it's like on Nature or something like that, where we're speaking about like uh, the disease into the E. coli. It's like the O157, something like that. It was like breaking down apart. They were literally saying it was going to go instinct, like it was going to die off, like the whole generation. I mean, that's a huge problem for them. It doesn't explain how it get there. How did the information get into the genome? Only what we see is that the mutation are breaking apart, you know, the genome is breaking apart in order to survive. It doesn't explain how it got there, and they cannot explain that. And B, he wrote an article about that too, which is pretty good. Yeah, they, they don't like the origin story too much. They would rather just start talking about the game after the dominoes are already standing. They don't care where the dominoes came from, as long as they're standing. That's all they care about. That's all evolution is, right? Remember, a biogenesis, don't touch it, don't deal with it. <laughs> that's their motto yeah, exactly <clears throat> it's exactly right and and we know it, it's so much easier to break something down than to actually build it up right and it's so funny how they'll say 
that there is no evidence for genetic entropy, you know, genomic degeneration. It's a made up concept by creationists. And as you pointed out, Matt, the fact that most deleterious mutations, as I put up here, the fact that they have extremely small negative effects on fitness, they're invisible to selection, they build up, they're subject to genetic drift, and they eventually degenerate, right? Um, this is being acknowledged by non-young earth creationist scientists, right? I mean, paper upon paper here, slightly deleterious mutations. Uh, Kimura acknowledged it, of course, Lynch, Mutational meltdown, for example, mutation accumulation in the extinction of small populations, quantifying the genomic decay paradox due to Muller's ratchet in, in human mitochondrial DNA. So this is recognized. And what they do is they invent they invent artificially contrived rescue, rescue mechanisms like synergistic epistasis, mutation count mechanism, okay? Or they will point out that humans, you know, for the most part, selection has been removed, okay, because now we take care of our sick, right? We help each other. As compared to in the wild, a lot of these mutations that may thrive in the human population, in the wild, okay, that mutation may be removed by natural selection, which means, which means the human population may degenerate faster, okay, than say some of your populations in the wild because selection can still help to slow down the process, but it's not gonna stop. Natural selection is not gonna stop genetic degeneration even in the wild because the fact is the effectively neutral mutations that are not your big massive mutations, okay? They're still invisible to selection. And um, the, the one thing that I wanted to point out too, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Um, is this argument that mutation chasm, you know, can, can solve the problem as in once enough of these deleterious mutations build up, now mother nature will be able to see the damage, for example, and, and remove the, 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 the mutated. But the problem is, is even if selection were to remove the worst, the worst mutants in the population. The fact is we are all still mutant, right? We are more mutant than our parents and more mutant than our grandparents, okay? So you can remove the worst, but you're still stuck. You're still left with people who are more mutant than the generation before it. So that's why it is inevitable that mutations will accumulate. So this whole mutation count mechanism, okay, for one, it's not biologically real. Um, the, the model doesn't even remotely resemble reality. And all of these artificially contrived mechanisms, they've been dealt with in uh, numerical simulations. They've been shown to fail, especially whenever realistic um, scenarios and realistic um mechanisms pertaining to selection, purifying selection are integrated into these simulations, it still shows that genetic degeneration is inevitable. And here's what's funny, I'll say this and then I'll yield, because Kimura, right, he just threw it out there, you know, beneficial mutations will counterbalance the damage, but he didn't do anything to demonstrate that. Okay, people like Dr. John Sanford, they've looked at this the most. They've looked at beneficial mutations. We know they are rare. And even your rare beneficial mutation is still deleterious for the most part, right? So it's about one in a million. And there's still typically deleterious effects associated with that um, mutation. So therefore, okay, for sake of argument evolutionists, let's give you one, let's give you 10 beneficial mutations that are truly not deleterious. That's still not going to counterbalance the damage due to the constant influx of these low impact deleterious mutations. Uh, a few rare beneficials, give it to them. It's not gonna counterbalance the damage. Um, what, what are your thoughts, gentlemen? Yeah, I, yeah, go ahead, Matt. Oh, I was just saying, yeah, how could they? How could they? I mean, you're literally, it, they're trying to say that selection is going to remove these deleterious mutations. Well, wouldn't that essentially get rid of diversity in life? Wouldn't we have almost no diversity if it's weeding out mutations as they're rising? 
It's literally countering their very statement, right? And what do we know when we look in the mitochondria? There's a saturation point that needs to be reached before you don't you no longer can see a mutation because it eventually starts turning over the same allele. Dr. Jensen ran it and said, you know, look at this. We have about 1,000 different changes going on. Um, here, I'll, I'll share it real quick. I'll show you what I mean. Um, right here. I got it. Thanks. So you can see Dr. Jensen's chart right here. And there's 1,483 actual mutations that have occurred over the amount of time. Right. So if evolution were true, we would we should see about 12,000 mutation saturation point. But we don't see anywhere near that. You know, if evolution was true, there would be about twenty one thousand four hundred and fifty seven. Right. But but of course, it would be maxed out at about twelve thousand. We don't see anywhere near that. Nowhere. So what's going on? We see genetic diversity inclining, you know, going up quickly, really, really fast, really rapid with fast mutation rates. But we don't see saturation whatsoever. That would have easily been reached in the evolutionary time scale. So something's going on. What is it? What's going on? Well, the bottleneck wasn't that long ago. That's it. In story. That that simple. We don't have to invoke the the the, the problem of well, maybe the mutation rates are different and selection is removing them. You know, that's just a rescue device. We see them occurring. We don't see selection removing anything but the worst. So to put a spin on it is just a rescue device. That's why we call it that. That's why I wrote a book called The Rescue Device. That's all it is. They just keep reaching. Yeah, but Matt, things. but Matt, Matt, you are ignoring variation in fitness and you are, are ignoring equilibrium of beneficial mutations and negative mutations. So, you know, you're just wrong because humans today exist at an equilibrium. Right. There's a mutation slash selection balance. So how do you respond to that? Well, if there was, then what's going on between the difference, the discrepancy between the African and the European lineages? Right. We see we see the Africans have the highest and then we see Europeans with the least amount. And evolutionists come along and they say, well, that's because Africans have been around longer. And then Dr. Jensen comes along and says real quick, no. It's because they have a faster generation time and that would speed up mutation rates. And therefore, they would have more differences because more generations have occurred. And then they might come along if they're smart and they would say, well, wait a minute. If Africans have had more generations, then wouldn't that mean genetic entropy would affect them more? Now, it would, except for other races were interbreeding early on, Europeans especially. So we broke our PRDM9, so recombination rates don't happen as quickly. And then all of a sudden we have more genetic entropy in these founding parents, and then we branch out, and now we have genetic problems that come along with that problem. That's why we have more genetic uh, problems than the Africans do who have had more generations in that time. So right. it's so easily answered in our model. And, and Matt, uh, people like Dan, they'll say, as long as you have selection, you will reach a selection slash mutation balance through this selectable variation within relative fitness, right, in populations. So Dan is saying that we will never actually go extinct because the most mutant will still always be selected out of the population. So he'll say, because of that, there is no reality of genetic degeneration. How would you respond to that? Okay, well, if this were the case, then we wouldn't see the problem of health that we actually have today in today's people. You know, we are literally having the first generation of people being born where the, their parents are outliving their children. We have heart disease, diabetes, cancer rates are off the charts. Almost one in every two people have them. Not to mention we have uh, fungus, mold, yeast, bacteria, viruses, parasites, heavy metal toxicity, free radical damage, acrylamides, mycotoxin. We can go down the list of all the different things that are corroding the body away and bombarding us. And we're getting genetically more broken down all the time. We have the average human being that's been tested is missing 100 genes. Those aren't just genes that are broken over time. They're completely missing now. They're like destroyed. We don't even have them to pass on, right? So there was a gene that your ancestors had that broke so badly there was actually nothing to pass down and for the grand 
kids to inherit. We have a gene like the MTHFR that's a notorious methylator. It determines on how well our bodies are going to methylate and cleanse out. And, and it also determines on how well functioning other genes are. This gene is broken by about 50% in the average person. And that's just if one mutation is in the gene. If there's two, it's broken 70%. And that, that controls the functionality of the genome. So we have that. I mean, if it's not, if this doesn't tell you well, something Matt, right. Yeah. Now, if I were to say, if I were to grant you everything that you're saying, okay, diseases accumulating every single year and every single generation in human populations, the fact that humans are degenerating. But what if I said this is simply because natural selection has been relaxed in the human population. Therefore, these diseases are allowed to accumulate where in the wild, right? In the wild, these diseases would not accumulate because there is not relaxed selection in the wild. These mutants in the, in the wild will be selected, selected out of the population. And therefore, those diseases and those mutants will not thrive as they do in the human population. How would you respond to that? I would have to say, well, that's easy. We have animals that, um, nothing is like a human, right? So we have the ability to survive genetic entropy because of our massive amounts of rapid population growth and our dispersion. We migrate, we travel extremely fast. We're like birds, right? We migrate, we travel around the world and we can live in every diverse environment that there is. So we're able to withstand this genetic entropy is where, that's why I said earlier, when we start looking at the places like the gorilla, for example, right? They're not migrating around. So their, their population size starts to dwindle and they're stuck in the rainforest in Africa. And guess what? Genomic meltdown. Exactly what would have happened to us if, that, if we were not migrating and traveling around doing that. So just because we don't see that in the human beings as much as we see it in the animal kingdom doesn't mean that it's not happening to us. We do see it in the animal kingdom. And well, it's no, well, 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 real quick, I, I'm saying that we do see the thousands and thousands of new diseases in the genetic database in humans every single year. But I'm, I'm uh, being devil's advocate here. I'm saying that the critics will say that is only because there has been relaxed selection in the human population, right? We take care of the sick, where in the, in the wild, the lions or the zebras or these various animal species, they're not taking care of the sick. So therefore there is no relaxed selection in the wild. So the only reason we're seeing incredible genetic meltdowns in terms of diseases, the critics will say that's only because there is relaxed selection in the human population today. Of course. Of course they can invoke that all they want, but it's happening in animals as well. Uh, we look at the, um, uh, we're looking right, at- Right, right. So that would be the argument. Is it happening in animals would be the argument then? Exactly, exactly. We look at a polar And you're bear. saying yes, it is, right? Of course, yeah. We look at polar bears, they're in genetic meltdown, right? And they've, they're they they're migrating, they're traveling as much as they can. They're blaming uh, global warming. It can be blamed on anything, but I'm just saying that they're going right. through this. They have uh, 15 genetic diseases on average, and they're, and they're being really hindered, really, really hindered from this. So they would need to do what we're doing, and they would need to explode in uh, population size, and they need to diversify and stop inbreeding, right? Because they're becoming more isolated, and they're coming down. They're going to die. That's it. So the only way to survive genetic entropy is through high population growth and migration. You have to disperse and then you don't see genetic entropy as fast. So the fact that we see it in humans at all, it shows you how detrimental genetic entropy is. And think about this. If genetic entropy wasn't a problem, and uh, why wouldn't they be just using the evolutionary model when it comes to health? This is the National Institute of Health, and they use the creationist model. If they don't care, they don't care about creation or evolution debate. They don't care which one is right. right. They don't care about the internet bickering that goes on. They care about what makes people better, what cures you. Well, why are they using the creationist model? Because that's the reality and that's what we see. We see it with dogs because we've been breeding them and then they go, oh, that's because they're out of selection. Ah, well, go look at wolves and tell me what you see there. You'll see the exact same thing. Right, Great right. Stuff. So, and here's the thing. It, the, the, the reality of genomic degeneration, it puts shelf lives on genomes. And that's the point, is the species that you see in the wild, 
that have not yet gone extinct due to genetic degeneration. It's because they have not been around for as long as the uniformitarian and the evolutionists would have us believe, okay? There are shelf lives on the genomes of living organisms. And the problem with the critic is they have a rescue device for all of these instances that you're pointing to, right? For example, polar bears, they'll say it's due to climate control. Um, when it comes to the uh, specific case of genetic meltdown in gorillas, they'll say this is because it's a small population. They're subject to in inbreeding, right? They'll say the same thing with uh, Neanderthal populations, mammoth populations, butterfly populations. We have all of these examples of genetic meltdown in these small populations. And they want to say that it is because they are subject to inbreeding right, as you were pointing out. But then we go all the way back to what we were talking about at the beginning. Inbreeding is a sneak preview into where we are going genetically as a species. Yeah, humans have a much larger population, but it doesn't change the fact that these mutations that are accumulating, the effectively neutral mutations that are accumulating from generation to generation, they're still only sub subject to genetic drift, okay? So even if these arguments Okay, even if we allow for these arguments that Dan is putting forth that I was kind of playing devil's advocate with you on in terms of relative fitness, okay, even if there is relative fitness, okay, and no one's denying this, say between individuals within the population and the fact that some individuals are better than others, it doesn't matter because we are still all multiply mutant. That's why I pointed out you can get rid of the worst, but you're still left with people who are more mutant than the generations before it. Okay, so that's the problem. There can be selectable variation within relative fit fitness, okay? But populations still only get worse. This is natural, okay? This is continuous because the mutations are continuously accumulating. You can go as far as this. You can go as far as this. Take the human population today, let's say 8 billion people, Okay, the fact that each generation has more mutations than the generation before it, remove 50% of the population that are the most mutant. Just, just remove them, okay? What we are left with is now 50% of the 8 billion people that are still more mutant. Okay, so all of these arguments, all of these arguments, equilibrium of beneficial mutations and negative mutations that Dan looks to, uh, we can look to fitness variation as well. Once again, all of these mechanisms only do what? They only slow down the, the, the genetic degeneration. They don't solve it. They don't solve it. And yes, we these examples of mammoths and polar bears, okay, these examples of butterfly populations, these examples of genetic meltdown, it's a sneak preview into where we are going genetically as a species. Because inbreeding, right, reveals the hidden reservoir of genetic mistakes in the genome and leads to rapid an accelerated genetic degeneration, which is where we are going as, as a human species. So even if there is some relaxed selection in the human population, all that's going to do is make the problem worse for human populations and a little bit better for animal species. But the effectively neutral mutations are still invisible to selection, just as much as they are in humans and just as much as they are in, um, in animals of every kind. Uh, go ahead, gentlemen, if you guys had a couple points you wanted to make there. Yeah, I <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't natural selection more of a filter than like, you know, removing the mutation? Doesn't it just filter them? Well, you can think right. of selection. Yeah, being able to, to see like, for example, if, uh, in, uh, if an A allele is beneficial, like, um, uh, let's say that there's an, an SNP that is um, homozygous and it's, it's in the father, but he marries somebody where it's heterozygous and they don't have a G or an A and a T comes along and it's a harmful mutation and it gets pushed into the child, but it's really, really harmful. What will happen is selection can just remove it. it. It can see it. It'll be like, you know what? If if I don't get rid of this, it's going to die. And yeah. selection can it can pick out these really detrimental ones that 
your life is in danger for. But the really small, the tentative ones that it doesn't care about, it, just, it doesn't even care to remove them because that's not its purpose, right? It's just trying to save you. It's basically your, uh, your rescue device. Yeah, and like, let's say like, even if we move, we move off of the population, I mean, there's still some, there's still more bad mutation than good mutation. So it's a big problem for them. Yeah. You know I mean? yeah like, well, that's the real big problem with inbreeding, right? Because once you, once both parents have a mutation and they become homozygous and they both have these detrimental mutations, the offspring stands no chance of ever being able to have selection remove them. So it's a guaranteed bad mutation every generation. And the more mm -hmm. you inbreed, the more generations happen, the the more of a problem you get until eventually it can't, the, the compounded mutation load is too much for the species to handle and you're just dead. So just like the mammoth, they couldn't take it anymore, right? They were up in the Arctic in the North and it was really cold and harsh and barren. And they were just small groups scattered around just like Neanderthal, right? And pretty soon isolated. And then pretty soon they were like, we need to get out of here probably. So they started migrating around, but they stayed in the tribes because you need each other in harsh conditions, right? And then inbreeding kept happening. More mutations kept pouring in, boom, gone. They're just, that was the end of it. There's too much accumulation. Like the good mutation cannot like, you know, override the bad mutation because they're extremely rare. Like you point out, you know, from those papers, they're super rare. The good mutation are rare, but yeah. the, the slightly bad mutation are more common, 60 to 200 mutation per generation. So let's say, let, let's just give them that. If you get one good mutation, one beneficial mutation every generation, but you get to 60 to 200 mutation that are slightly not good how long does it take to over you know overtake the bad mutation by good mutation it just doesn't happen you know if you get one every generation and 200 bad mutation every generation well it's never going right. to overgrow the other mutations so that's a big problem for them there because there's too much bad mutation and not enough good mutation to survive so that's why they end up dying so that's a great point and this is one of their go-to rescue mechanisms, okay? Uh, kind of what you're touching on there. I debated Dr. Stefan Frello over a year ago now, actually. And his argument, his main argument for genetic entropy to counter genetic entropy was the argument from there being a trade-off, right? These beneficial mutations, okay, sometimes they'll look to what's called a super beneficial mutation will counterbalance the damage. Right. But the problem is because of the influx of all of these massive numbers of low impact deleterious mutations from generation to generation, those very few, okay, beneficial mutations that occur are not going to be, uh, be capable of counterbalancing this, this damage. Look at it this way, okay? Um, we've got a genome that is degenerating in many ways. Okay. And then you may have a few single nucleotide sites. Okay. Based on the rare beneficial mutations. Okay. That are improving. Let's say there's a few nucleotide sites that are improving, uh, improving. Well, from generation to generation, we've got massive numbers of effectively neutral deleterious mutations accumulating. That means we have huge numbers of nucleotide sites that are degrading. Okay, information is being lost. So that means this trade-off that they look to, okay? It's not sustainable because do you know what a trade-off results in? A trade-off results in a shrinking functional genome size. That's actually what we see in Lenski's experiment right now, okay? So basically you're just throwing out all this information, okay? From a multitude of nucleotide sites and then the evolutionists want to try and replace all that information with, you know, desirable point mutations or the rare beneficial gene duplication. Okay. It's not going to work for one. Most beneficial mutations are reductive and functionally compromising to the organism. Okay. So even your best beneficial mutations are not actually taking things forward. <laughs> they themselves are degrading. You know, I'm going to use this analogy and then I'll yield because I like this analogy. It's kind of like um, take a car, 
and you want better gas mileage for your car just temporarily, okay? So you decide to start throwing things off, okay? Removing weight, remove the doors, okay? Remove the mirrors, take off weight. You're going to get better gas mileage for the time being. But guess what? Overall, this is damaging and degrading to the car, okay? It's only short-term advantage, but long-term damage. And that's what we oftentimes mm -hmm. see in these evolutionary experiments, like the Lenski experiment. A lot of these bacteria, they are adapting for short-term purposes, short-term gain, but it's long-term degeneration. It's called adaptive degeneration. It's reductive evolution. Okay. And this is the best that, um, that they can look to, you know, this whole trade-off or beneficial mutations, these rescue mechanisms like synergistic epistasis, mutation count mechanism, none of these, none of these rescue devices and arguments can solve this problem. Uh, go ahead, gentlemen. Yeah, exactly. It's like <clears throat> you have a car, you know, you have some gas, let's say you have like 60% of gas in, and now you're, you're driving, you're driving, and you know, you hit something, it's going to give you a bit more gas. But after that short period, you're going to lose more. You know, they're just going to try to survive for that moment. But after they're just going to degenerate more, they're just going to lose more and more and more since of that, you know, boost. So that's how I see like mutation. Like, you know, they'll just adapt by throwing off gene, by throwing off stuff. But after it's going to big impact them because there's going to be too much of that stuff that has been lost. So it's going to be a big problem for them you know, in like, let's say 1 billion years, just so they cannot explain all those type of stuff. Like, you know, they always claim that mutation is the mechanism that the whole diversity and complexion in our body, but all we see, it's, it doesn't explain how it got there. It just explains how it survived by dropping off other gene, you know, but they'll just dodge, say, oh, just give it time. There's going to be good mutation that that's going to come off and, you know, just remove those, but it's just dodge and dodge and dodge over and over again. Well, it's one of the reasons. Right. So you've even. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. I was going to say, that's why they are realizing when they look at these deleterious mutations on how harmful they are, they go, well, they obviously couldn't have been around that long because they're too damaging and we would have never survived. That's why they threw them back. by now they can account for the reasons like, oh, it was probably farming when we started industrializing our food. And then we started eating grain that we've never consumed before. And it started mutating the body in a way that it's never done. Or maybe something happened to the atmosphere and there was a big change, you know, and, and this allowed more mutations to really bump, start bombarding. It. And then we messed up the ozone layer. And then the ozone layer wasn't able to reflect a lot of the ultraviolet the sea rays that are the you know, the highest, the worst type of radiation and that bombarded us, made it even worse. So there's all these reasons why they're accounting for military mutations being more recent, but in reality, they've always been this bad. It's just not going back 200,000 years. They don't recognize what they're saying. You see, they know the mutations are recent. They just can't make sense of it in the evolutionary view. So they come up with these these ideas right these these concepts these imagination right imagination yeah and well they're they just to. like exactly it's like you know Mick, michael b he he was doing some good stuff about like he has a good series on mutation and the big problem with it you know he always goes around he gave like the example of the polar bear you know he had like a gene that was coding for his uh it was coding for his color his skin color and it migrated to the south, you know, it went into a, a place where it was uh, hotter, you know, less wind and less like snow. And like literally when he entered there, like in that zone, like he took a couple months and he literally break down his gene for his uh, color coding. I don't know if you ever saw that. He, he did a paper about that, about like the result of mutation. So no, like I it just, it just keep dropping off. I mean... You know, it doesn't explain once again how did the color gene get there? How did it form? How did mutation lead it to you know getting that color? If right. it just keep removing it, removing it over and over again, I mean, it just it, it just mind blowing just in my face. It's a recent creation that has been created and it's just dropping off. It's like it just it's just so obvious, man. How can you not see it? Right. It's the same. 
it's the same thing with what they say about human skin color, right? Like, where did we get our skin color? Well, they said the first humans had black skin, right? That humans branched off and we evolved black skin in Africa because that's the most protective skin. And then over time, mutations came along and they turned our skin white when we started migrating and traveling around. It, it needed to, right? We're up in the cold north. We don't need black skin anymore because we need to absorb more vitamin D from the sun. So we need to be more pale for that. That's why women worldwide are always more pale than men because they need to be to, because they need to produce milk with more vitamin D. So what they do, they looked over and then they found primates are actually all white when you shave them. So they're like, oh, uh, whoops. Okay. Well, maybe the a mutation arose to cause black skin first. And then once they got black skin, then they got the mutation that messed that melanin up to begin with, right? Because apes don't have melanin. They don't have any skin color. You shave them down, they're completely pale. They don't have anything. So they had to account for maybe a mutation came along, a new gene, you know, popped up, and then a mutation arose, causing pigmentation to begin with in the first place. And then a mutation changed that and allowed other skin colors to evolve. Ours is real simple. Our models, it was created. You have it, you have brown skin, and it can code for all the different skin colors, and it can do it very, very quickly. What do we see? Exactly that. And guess what? You take two white people, they can, through recombination alone, they can never produce a black child, just like two black people through recombination alone can never make a white child, but yet a, a brown skin person with recombination can do both of those things. So very unique, right? What does our model say? It uses gene conversion recombination as the major mechanism, and that's what we see. So just go with the evidence. Yeah. Actually, if I yeah, could jump in here real quick. Um, actually, first I want to point out that uh, in the audience, see Science Film Labs. Good to see you, brother. Look up Young Earth Creation. I'm going to add, uh, Matt, I'm going to add your channel where you are uploading all, all our videos and work. I'm going to okay. add it in, in my featured channel section. And I wanted to point out that that channel is over 5,000 subscribers now. And the flood video we put out like over a year ago is now at like 300,000 subscribers. So <laughs> share yeah, that around. It's her? completely gone. Oh, yeah, man. Just, that was amazing. I mean, yeah. Um, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to derail the conversation too much. So I just saw that, but I want to ask Matt because he's really knowledgeable on this subject. Even a lot of your so-called beneficial mutations that they look to and they try and argue for, right? Yeah. Those ones that are rare that they say are going to counterbalance the damage. Um, we now know that a lot of those are just general adaptation, epigenetic, for example, based on the environment. Can you touch on that a little bit, Matt? Uh, yeah, epigenetics is really bizarre because two identical twins can be born and yet they can move away from each other. One can move into the north and one can move into the south or one can live in the high altitudes and one can stay low. And the genes on how they react to those environments will be totally different. So the person that's living at the high altitude will be able to... Um, be able to store more oxygen. So when they travel in those areas where there's less oxygen, they survive better. That's what the Sherpa people do. And they thought this was a beneficial mutation for a very long time because they said, wow, these people live up there. They must have evolved the ability to live at these very high regions to do that. Well, the problem was is their offspring didn't have the ability. So if it was a mutation and it never got handed down, then what's really going on? Because lactose tolerance you can hand down, right? So they're like, what's going on here? Like, wh what's really going on? So they figured out, no, this is just a switch. They live up in this region. The body says, I need to adapt to this. And it's just a, a, a flip that gets switched on. And you can control this yourself. I do it all the time. For example, I take tinctures for it. Now, as you can see from my face, I like fighting. So I'm getting hurt all the time. So how do I offset a lot of the damage that's being inflicted onto my body all the time? Well, I need to activate genes that are turned on that I need to turn off because by turning them off, they turn on other genes. So for example, there's a gene, there's a, a process that's called mTOR. And mTOR, once it's turned off, activates longevity genes. And it's done by caloric restriction. Because you see what happens when we're de deprived of nutrients, 
we our ability to survive that relies based on our genes. So these epigenetic switches have to get flipped on or we're going to starve to death. So how does it keep you alive through a famine? That's epigenetics. So we've learned that genes are all based on these little tiny switches that get flipped on based on what we're doing and where we live. And none of them have to do with these mutations whatsoever. So everything that they used to believe were beneficial mutations have just turned out to be little epigenetic switches that we can turn on. And after about three or four generations, they're gone. They're no longer there. Yeah, there's a there's even a paper it was published by uh, his name is um, Alexei Kondrashvov. It's a Russian name. You know, he says in modern human population, mutation with small e e eventual effect are probably accumulating faster than they are being eliminated by selection. Basically, he's saying that uh, there's more mutation that are getting into herself than that natural selection can see. Oh, man. But I've, he's lucky he's not on Team Dodgeball. He would have never admitted that one. Oh, yeah. But, you know, only John Sanford believe in you know, genetic entropy, a stupid creationist. That's just all they say. I mean, it's just, apparently, according to them, we don't understand evolution, therefore we're not required. It's like Professor Dave saying that Dr. James Storr should not even be teaching science because you believe the resurrection of Christ. I mean, <laughs> how stupid. It just you guys shows their incredible bias. Yeah. Yeah, you guys always and, and you know, and heard that. What I was saying, I just want to point out, Oh, I'm sorry. What's that, Will? No, no, go ahead. So I was just going to say, so based on uh, what you were saying, Matt, when it comes to these epigenetic-related adaptations, right? So now a lot of their so-called beneficial mutations are just general adaptive episodes based on the pre-programmed capacity to change, right? These switches are already in the genome just waiting to be turned on due to epigenetic regulation and the correct environmental input. So that's not going to help them. That's not going to help counterbalancing the damage. And now the few rare so-called beneficial mutations that are actually, let's say, mutation related, typically they are reductive and functionally compromising to the organism, which means there's nothing that they can look to that's going to counterbalance the damage. <laughs> the fact is, what we see is reduction in genetic um, functionality. We see most mutations are effectively neutral. We see general adaptive episodes, let's say these epigenetic changes, which is perfectly consistent and expected from the design diversity starting point. So there's nothing that's there's nothing that's going to save them. And as Will pointed out, I mean, you've got population geneticists. <laughs> They're recognizing, like Alexei Kondrashov, that are recognizing that man is presently degenerating.